On behalf of the City of Vincent, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd like to let members of the public gallery know that we do web stream our council briefings and meetings, but that we don't commence the live stream until we've concluded public question time, so your comments won't be live streamed if you do choose to talk this evening. Um, CEO, I think that in terms of apologies, we just have Councillor Harley away this evening for work-related um, business. And we will now move to public question time. So members of the public gallery, welcome to the meeting. You're welcome to approach the microphone and speak on an item on the agenda this evening. We do ask that you state your name, your address, and the item to which you're speaking this evening. So. Um, we are now going to go to the CEO for declarations of interest. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Council members, we've received a number of disclosures of interest this evening, so I'll just run through all of them. The first is from Councillor Joanne Fatakis in relation to item 12.1, appointment of community members to advisory and working groups. The extent of Councillor Fatakis's interest is that uh, firstly, through her work on Leadable Connect Management Committee, the Light Up Leadable Carnival and North Perth Local, she has worked with a number of individuals nominated to serve on the Business Advisory Group, Arts Advisory Group and Children and Young People Advisory Group. And secondly, two of the individuals nominated on the Environmental Advisory Group provided assistance to Councillor Fatakis during her council election campaign in the form of letter dropping and displaying an advertising sign on their property. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Fataka's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Uh, also, a disclosure of impartiality interest from Councillor Fatakis on item 5.4, the proposed Harwood Place item. The extent of Councillor Fatakis's interest in this matter is that she was employed by a real estate firm owned by the owner of the property between 1997 and 2003. As a consequence, there may be a perception that her impartiality on the matter could be affected. Further impartiality interest disclosure from Councillor Joanne Fatakis on item 8.2, Manor Inc. The extent of the interest is that Councillor Fatakis is the owner of an investment property on Beaufort Street located near the subject site in World Square. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Fatakis's impartiality interest on the matter could be affected. A further impartiality interest from Councillor Dan Lowden on our item 8.1, Loftus Community Centre. The extent of Councillor Lowden's interest is that he is formerly a member of the Loftus Playgroup approximately two years ago. As a consequence, there may be a perception that his impartiality on the matter could be affected. An impartiality interest disclosure also from Councillor Susan Gondoszewski in item 12.1, appointment of community members to advisory and working groups. The extent of Councillor Gontoszewski's interest is that she has had contact with one of the applicants for the advisory groups in her role as a member of the Highgate Primary School Board. As a consequence, there may be a perception that her impartiality interest or her impartiality on the matter could be affected. An impartiality interest disclosure has also been received from Mayor Emma Cole in relation to item 8.1, Loftus Community Centre. The extent of Mayor Cole's interest being that her children have been enrolled in programs at the centre in the past and one of her children continues to access a program where the operator has a room hire arrangement with Loftus Community Centre. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Mayor Cole's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Uh, council members, I have also uh, disclosed an impartiality interest in item 9.2, draft CO performance review policy. The extent of my interest is that the draft policy provides guidance for conducting the annual performance review for the position of CEO which I currently hold. I have also disclosed a financial interest in item 12.2, uh, draft CO KPIs for 2017-18. The extent of my interest in that item is that the key performance indicators that are ultimately agreed with Council through that report will form the basis for my next annual performance review, which will include a review of my remuneration. 
And the last disclosure I've received is from Councillor Castle. It's a financial interest disclosure in item 5.5, Town Centre Place Plans. The extent of Councillor Castle's interest is that she has an ongoing annual contract to provide graphic and web design, marketing and social media management services to the Mount Hawthorne Hub and Leadable Connect. This relationship could be impacted by future council investment in town centres or support for town teams in line with the draft town centre place plans. I have nothing further, Mayor Cole. Thank you, CEO. All right, we'll now move through the reports and ask questions. Um, but what I will suggest is, given that we've had two members of the public attend and ask questions on particular items tonight, that we go to those items first, given that they are still in the public gallery and probably um, be interested in hearing the questions and answers. So the first item on that basis will be um, item 8.4, which is a late report, Florida Athena Football Club, Litter Stadium Master Plan. Councillors, are there questions on this item? All right, well, I'll start. Um, well, um, what I wanted to do is just go through some of the questions that were asked in a letter that council members received today um, from um, Demetrius Thomas, president of the Florida Athena Football Club. There is a series of questions, so what I might do is just go through those questions and then go to the Director of Community Engagement to answer. Um, one of the questions raised was about the... I'll go to the first question, which has also been raised in public question time tonight, is about the issue of why um, administration is not recommending going out to further community consultation on the master plan. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh in accordance with the council resolution from December 2016, administration um, did allow ourselves six months between the submission of the master plan documentation and the expiry of the current lease for Litter Stadium. Um, what we did is, is programmed uh, a number of months for review of, of the master plan, followed by liaison with stakeholders followed by public comment, um, followed by a council workshop and then returning the report to council. Upon administration reviewing the master plan, uh, it was clear there were two key components that were missing from the documentation, those being the, the facility management plan and the financial plan. Um, upon further review of, of, of that lack of information in the context of the broader master plan, it was determined uh, what well, Administration identified some key concerns about the deliverability of the master plan and on that basis it was not deemed appropriate to take the master plan to public comment on the basis that it may either raise expectations or raise community angst um, in its current format. Uh, so on that basis, uh, administration have opted to take a report directly back to council and not proceed with community consultation at this point in time. Thank you, Director. Um, you partly went to the issue. One of the other questions was about the timing of the report to Council and the length of time taken to inform Florida Athena Football Club of issues arising from the master plan and the associated documents. Yes, again through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, the master plan is quite a quite a large document, um, as, as we would um, have expected, given the, the scale of the stadium and the, the requests from the club. So it did, in take, did indeed take a, a period of time for administration to work our way through that. Um, obviously, that was one project amongst a number of others that we were working through at the time. Um, but I personally, along with the acting manager of community partnerships, um, did methodically go through the master plan page by page um, to ensure that it was due considered. Uh, that did indeed take a, a number of months. Uh, we actually completed the review of the master plan in early September. At that point in time we, we took our findings to the city ex executive team. Um, we sought advice from Football West and the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries um, to, to make a, a strong and well-informed decision about uh, what direction we thought we should take um, the, the Council report. And so, uh, yes, it was a number of months and it wasn't until early October that we're in a position to 
advise the club specifically of what the gaps were and, and what our particular concerns were. Um, having said that, again, uh, that's the exact reason why we provided a six-month time frame between the documentation being delivered on the 30th of June and the intention to bring the report back to Council in December 2017. So the time frame from the city, from administration's perspective is, is as we expected. Um, one of the other comments in the letter received by council members today was that the club felt shocked and baffled by the feedback received and that they were having three weekly meetings with administration and they felt that there was uh, that they were in sync with administration on um, what was to be included. Um, could you please respond to that concern? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, there, there was really two elements I would refer to in that regard. First of all, the uh, Council's uh, report from December 2016 and the associated resolution is quite explicit. It does say a master plan and then it specifically references key elements that were to be provided and the facility management plan, community benefits statement and financial plan were amongst those. So um, from administration's perspective, there was absolute clarity around what Council was expecting to be provided um, back for decision-making purposes. Uh, equally, uh, yes, at, at Council's request, administration did meet regularly with the club or, or their consultants to, to have status updates on the project. Um, the City did indeed receive a, a project plan um, which identified all the key tasks that would be undertaken by the consultant team and that did very specifically reference um, the preparation of um, financial operating budgets and, and management plans. So um, administration's view based on the project plan was that that body of work or those tasks were being undertaken um, to lead towards the preparation of a facility management plan and a financial plan, but unfortunately those two plans weren't forthcoming in the, in the final master plan documentation. Um, thank you, Director. Um, do you have any comment in relation to the recommendation to, um, for the lease term being a two-year with, with a one-year option to the city as opposed to a three-year lease as requested by the club? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the, uh, I guess the strategy or the, the, the idea behind the, the structure of the lease is to, to enable, uh, first of all, the club to have a reasonable period of time, and that being two years, to progress some more of their organisational and, and financial planning. Um, two years also gives them a level of certainty in terms of their, their future for their, for their club and the competitions they participate in, so that was certainly seen as more than fair. Um, however, the, the city does still have concerns about uh, the club's um, propensity to deliver um, these necessary outcomes and I guess what we're mindful of is getting to the end of this three year term um, when, we're, when we will have completed um, all going well the Britannia Reserve Master Plan Review and the club still not having the required documentation to either um, provide the basis for further decision making around a, a further lease or even just uh, to consider their organisational capacity and sustainability. So the two plus one option is really to ensure the club um, has emphasis on this and a year out from um, the master plan review of Britannia Reserve um, we can make sure through the one year option that the club is indeed progressing some of these very necessary planning documents. Just on that, does it also give the city some flexibility if we were somehow found it possible to bring forward our own master planning exercise at Britannia Reserve? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, it certainly will. And, and uh, I guess there's a precedence this year where, um, for valid reasons, we brought the Banks Reserve master plan forward and pushed some of the other master plans out. And over the coming years, depending on community demands, that may indeed happen again. So that is one of the other advantages. Thank you. Um, one of the other um, comments or concerns raised in the letter was that um, Florian Athena had felt that they had provided sufficient financial information to give confidence to the city of achievable and realistic strategies. Would you like to comment in relation to that? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, the financial planning or lack thereof is probably the main concern that administration has. Uh, yet 
Indeed, the master plan does provide uh, facility cost estimates provided by a quantity surveyor. Uh, it does provide some life cycle cost analysis information and it does provide a proposed capital funding model, albeit that capital funding model is reliant upon um, capital fundraising by the club as well as external grants. So there is certainly a level of financial information within the master plan, but what it uh, doesn't provide is uh, the, the club's current financial position how much money they've got in the bank, um, how much money they have in reserve for this purpose, uh, and, and also what projected financial impact the master plan will have, um, whether that be positive impacts to revenue or um, negative impacts to expenditure. So there are a number of key gaps that raise serious concerns, not so much about um, just the delivery of the facility improvement works, but actually the club's capacity then to uh, fund ongoing asset management and facility management obligations over the period of a long-term lease. So the financial planning information uh, is certainly not there within the master plan, and that was one of the administration's key concerns. Thank you, Director. And just um, there was some also a comment from um, Florida Athena Football Club saying that they have a position on sharing the facility and that they are taking steps towards co-location. Is there anything that you can add to that in terms of what sort of co-location is being considered? Um, is it um, co-location in terms of use of the pitch? Is it use of the, the, the um, buildings? What, what sort of um, proposals have been put forward so far on co-location through this process? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, the master plan refers to uh, co-location in the sense of uh, potentially attracting some not-for-profit community group lessees to the undercroft of a, of a refurbished grandstand. Um, it also uh, provides, uh, I guess, a, a co-tenant opportunity within the, uh, the old velodrome turnstiles if that was to be converted to a kiosk. Um, it also does note um, potential use by Leadable Cricket Club of uh, change rooms if they are to be uh, refurbished as well. Um, it doesn't include co-location or, or shared use of the pitch itself um, and it doesn't consider apart from under a circumstance where there would be a, a full artificial pitch, it doesn't consider other sporting codes to be co-located at the stadium and, and use the pitch. Uh, that, that is an important point um, because that is uh, something that the city and our and administration in particular has been pushing to all of our sporting clubs and was raised directly with the club. And indeed, when I met on site with uh, the executive director from um, Sport and Recreation next door, uh, that was the first question they asked of administration. And also, given the state's limited finances, said that would be a key consideration um, with any CSRFF applications in the future. Thank you, Director. That actually brought me to my final question, which is a question for myself rather than through the letter received from Florida Athena Football Club, which was in relation to comments in the report about having um, liaison with Football West and local government sports and cultural industries, and are you able to provide any um, rundown on any of the feedback or comments from um, Football West and, and uh, the old sports and rec? rec. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that the correspondence with Football West um, was very much uh, a case of keeping the State Sporting Association informed with the status of the master plan and, and the city's, at least administration's, likely direction. Um, Football West certainly did uh, provide uh, their ongoing support in terms of making sure that whatever steps were necessary would be taken so that the club remains sustainable. Um, and they did reaffirm that the club is an important part of the National Premier League and therefore a facility in some way, shape or form is an important consideration for Football West. Um, from the Department of, um, I'll call it Sport and Recreation for Ease, um, th their view was very much around um, proper and well-informed facility planning. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, took them out on site to look at not just Litter Stadium, but Britannia Reserve more broadly. Uh, their commentary was very much around um, good facility planning, um, doing all of this forward planning work like facility management plans, financial planning, business case development, before um, anyone embarks upon any level of capital work. So uh, that was generally the, um, I guess, the main thrust of the feedback from the department. Did they provide any commentary in relation to co-location of sporting clubs? Was that something that was discussed? 
Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Co-location was um, literally the first um, bit of information that the department wanted to discuss further. Um, they did reference, although a different context, uh, the shared use between uh, East Perth and Subiaco football clubs at Leadable Oval um, and, and queried uh, whether that same uh, principle could be applied to National Premier League clubs. Um, whilst it hasn't necessarily been to this point in time, they certainly saw that as something necessary for both Football West and local governments to consider, given uh, the Football West MPL facility requirements um, expect quite a lot from community venues and local governments won't necessarily be able to provide those for multiple stadiums, for multiple clubs throughout the Perth metropolitan area. Thank you, Director Councillors. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Um, just wanted to just flag an amendment to, um, to, ask, to ask for it to be prepared for 5.1. So just to change actually two amendments, one would be two years and one would be three years. Just, uh, I don't, I'll ask, actually we'll ask it as a question. I don't understand what a two year plus one year option is if the op option is at our discretion because you can't force someone to take on the lease. So a two year plus one year option at our discretion to me becomes a a new lease opportunity at the end of two years, uh, which we can't commit a, f a f council to uh, down the track, as far as I'm aware. Because, can you just clarify that, please? My understanding is it's either a two-year lease or a three-year lease, or a two-year with an option to the uh, to the lessee, which I understand is not the intent of the recommendation. So, I'll ask that through you, um, either to the CEO or to the director. Uh, through the chair, um, I'll take that one. Uh, in terms of the intent of the provision, it, it is that the city would only be dealing with um, this particular group, and so therefore it's a two-year option, but yes, with a, a two-year lease, but with an option um, that is at the discretion of council, but it would not consider a lease to anybody else unless circumstances warranted um, a total total look at it. So it, therefore it could be an administrative process um, in terms of, of that renewal if all things had been delivered that were expected to be delivered in that time. So it's, we're not opening the door to say this is only a two year lease and at the end of two year lease you're, you're out of there and we're not, we're not going to consider any further options. This is to leave the door open that subject to the provision of information that's on the, um, the books that we're saying we need, the council will consider a further one-year lease to the group. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next item that was raised from the public gallery, and that was item 5.4. Um, it, it did come in as a very late report, only just half an hour before the meeting, so I'm not sure if anyone's had a chance to get their questions ready, but it's um, further report on numbers 1 to 16, 17, Harwood Place, West Perth, change of use from multiple dwellings to service apartments, amendment to approval. Are there any questions? Councillor Toppleberg? Thank you. Just the applicant's understanding was that the, uh, well firstly if we can just uh, have some commentary around the validity of the proposed planning condition. Uh, that limits the, uh, well, that, that proposes to change the number of nights, um, I guess it proposes to amend the management plan. Um, so I guess that probably answers my own question. Uh, but also the applicant is of the understanding that that was the point of the meeting last Wednesday and that it was uh, either agreed or that it was understood that there would be a change to a two night, two night minimum and that some of the issues relating to the street perhaps didn't weren't directly related to the Apartments. Well, I might just start by saying, as someone who was at the meeting, um, my understanding of the meeting was that points were discussed, but there weren't actually agreed outcomes. So in terms of there being an agreement that it would um, be a two-night minimum stay, that wasn't my understanding. Um, there was no um, agreement as such. It was basically discussion-based. So I'll just um, go to the director or manager to just um, see if they wish to add to that. Yes, through you, Mayor. Um, I have the manager here who was at the meeting um, and is the authorizer of the report, so I'll, I'll hand to her to answer the questions on this report. Um, through the Chair, um, as Mekol has indicated, um, the discussion that did take place um, was revolving around um, the concepts uh, on the 
noise and antisocial behaviour and the need for a 24-hour um, manned reception desk. Um, they were the principal um, matters that were discussed um, and obviously are articulated in the report. Um, as Mayor Cole indicated, there were no agreed outcomes. The applicant hasn't submitted anything further in terms of a justification as to um, why the reduction um, should be warranted in light of those changes, but it is something that the administration um, will discuss with the applicant between um, now and uh, the council meeting. I think there was also a question in re relation to um, three night minimum stay being a, a valid planning consideration. Through you, Mayor Cole, as um, Councillor Topperberg mentioned, um, the condition is requiring the management plan to be amended and the management plan is what sets um, the minimum stay. Um, so it is a valid condition to amend that management plan to be consistent with the, the current management plan which sets a three night minimum stay. Councillors, any further questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just in relation to other um, developments of this nature and the management plans that may relate to them, um, do they set out a, um, they have a standard uh, provision relating to minimum stay and um, does that vary in relation to the um, community concerns or the um, nature of the um, development? Through you, Mayor Cole, we'll have to take that on notice um, and have a look back to understand what existing approvals exist and what the minimum night stays are, if any. Can I also ask, um, I assume that it's come in at, at a point that there hasn't been able to have an opportunity for residents who attended the meeting last Thursday to look at the new recommendation and provide any comment at this point? Um, through uh, the chair, no. The email was circulated to all those who made submissions and those present at the meeting this afternoon as soon as the agenda item was released. Just tell them when you got the management plan. Um, the management plan, just to um, clarify that the management plan was received by the city um, yesterday, uh, yesterday morning. So uh, we, we did receive some further information this morning from the applicant as well, um, and that obviously... Um, resulted in the, the delay in the item being released. Um, could I just request that any feedback from residents or attendees at the meeting being incorporated into the briefing notes that are circulated to council members on Friday? Thank you. Councillors? Okay, we'll move back to the start of the agenda. We're starting back at item 5.1, which is 399 William Street, proposed amendment of hours to operation or previous approval, change of use from eating house to small bar, etc. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Loden. Just a minor clarification. So the, the previous meeting we had um, a tavern which was just down the road from this and this is a small bar. Can you just clarify the difference why this is a small bar and the other one is a tavern? Through the Mayor, it relates to the liquor licence. Um, so a tavern is defined by the scheme as a venue that has a tavern licence. Um, this proposal is applying for a small bar liquor licence, not a tavern liquor licence. So it can't be defined as a tavern. It can't be defined as anything else in the city scheme either. So it becomes an unlisted use and, and we've been calling um, those that have small bar licences small bars, unlisted use. So it's, it's, not, it's not a use listed in the scheme. Well, well, a tavern is. Yes, it does come down to packaged alcohol, which is why that place that was much smaller had to have a tavern licence, because they were selling wine to take away. Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you, and I'll preface my question by saying that I know we've moved through a lot of the backlog, but I did note it took 112 days effectively to apply to open up on Sunday nights for the extra two hours before public holidays. Is there any reason why the application wasn't able to be assessed within the, uh, within the, the um, statutory time frame? Through the Mayor, I'll have to take that on notice and understand the background. I. <coughs> It is, um, it's just outside the time frame and I would hope that with a full team and new processes which we've been implementing in the last month or so, um, that that won't occur in the future. 
just on just on that, I will ask, well note or ask. So the advertising complete on the twenty first of September. So I would assume that there'd be a chunk of those days that would have been as a result of the monthly meeting cycle. That it wouldn't have it would have just missed out on being suitable to come to the October meeting, uh, which means that it was therefore delayed effectively four weeks because we only have a monthly meeting cycle. Would that be fair? If you, you can take that on notice, but my guess is given that it was advertised relatively quickly, but it just missed the cutoff for the monthly meeting cycle. Uh, through the Mayor, I'll take that on notice. Um, it did take a period of time for the application to be advertised, longer than um, the new process that we have just implemented would um, would allow because we need to advertise these applications as soon as they're received to ensure adequate time for the applicant to respond to um, submissions that are received um, and uh, and still make um, the council meetings within the 90 day time frame. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, move on to the next item which is uh, number 1662 Robinson Avenue, Perth, and numbers 5 and 7 Brisbane Terrace, Perth, proposed amendment to condition of approval for four group dwellings. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Toppelberg. Um, am I correct that the original recommendation was because the policy required dilapidation reports for any heritage uh, listed properties within a 150 metre radius? And if, if that's why it was originally required, uh, will we be seeing a proposed amendment to the policy giving, given that obviously the intent of the policy was not to require this level of, uh, or th this level of investment by a effectively four-dwelling development? Through the Mayor, the current policy um, does not include a requirement for all heritage properties uh, within 150 metres to be, uh, to include a dilapidation report. Um, at the time that this decision or the report was presented to council and this recommendation made, the policy also didn't include that requirement. It was prior to that, um, to this original development application being approved, that that policy um, had that requirement. So it was a hangover. Uh, the, the officers at the time um, still considered the previous provisions when assessing that application. Um, and we're looking for a justification from the applicant as to why the proposal wouldn't impact on the heritage properties in the, in the vicinity, particularly given the location of this development. So um, there's no need to uh, amend the policy. It's already been amended to address the issue. Yeah. Councillors, um, I think this would be a very good example to raise on the issue of why we should have no demolition without DA if we're ever raising that issue with the, the Minister again. Um, I just wanted to seek some feedback on the applicant's views. I note that they have already completed two um, dilapidation reports for the adjoining properties and felt that that was sufficient based on their dilapidation survey performance solution report and that the City is recommending seven properties in total. Um, how has the applicant responded to that request? Yes, through your Mayor Cole, we've spoken to the applicant and they've confirmed that they are comfortable with completing the dilapidation reports recommended um, in this condition. Uh, they've completed most, most of those already, so they have done the adjoining properties as well, or some of the adjoining properties as well. There's a few um, outstanding that they would need to, need to comply with and, and they're comfortable with doing that. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, item 5.3, number 6, Church Street, Perth, proposed amendment to previous approval, which was a change of use from a recreational facility, yoga studio, to recreational facility, yoga studio, group fitness and personal training gym. And this is a retrospective application. Any comments or, sorry, any questions in relation to this one? Councillor Hallett. Sorry if this is a bit tangential. Um, is this related to the, I guess, acoustic checks for this um, location and wondering how, how comprehensive are they? Um, just thinking about another site that we've had some discussions um, about, um, obviously on a, another floor, so it's slightly different, but um, does it include, I guess, all types of um, noises that can be produced in group fitness settings? Through the Mayor. I doubt that it includes all types of noises. Um, there are certain assumptions that are included as part of these assessments. Um, the city 
is very aware of the issues we've had in the past um, in relation to uh, noise from, from gyms um, and we've learned a lot of lessons through that process and we're comfortable that the applicant in this case has addressed um, reasonably within a reasonable set of assumptions what kind of noise would be created by this development in this location um, and they've certainly addressed uh, all the recommendations that came out of that report and implemented them um, in the insulation and um, design and construction of the building. So um, we're satisfied with that in this case. Further questions? Okay. We've dealt with item 5.4 earlier on, so we'll move to 5.5, .5, Town Centre Place Plans. Councillor Murphy. Yes, um, sorry. Uh, in light of uh, Councillor Castle's um, declaration, I think I should also declare a financial interest um, based on my work with Leadable Connect to Mount Hawthorne Hub. If that's okay, if I can uh, leave <laughs> for this item. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify, um, Councillor Murphy, as I understand it, um, is disclosing a financial interest on the basis that he um, is engaged by those town teams to assist with the conduct of events and as a consequence is disclosing a financial interest. Um, that being the case, um, I'll get Councillor Murphy to complete the financial interest disclosure form while he's out of the chambers. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, are there any further disclosures or questions? Councillor Fatakis. Just press it? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, it's just a, uh, an impartiality interest on item 5.5. Um, I'm involved with Leaderville Connects Management Committee and the Light Up Leaderville um, Carnival and North Perth Local. So there may be, um, and that involvement's as a volunteer, but there may be a perception of my impartiality on this matter may be affected. Thank you, Councillor Fatakis. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, thanks. If Councillor Fatakis could please um, just complete an impartiality interest form um, with that disclosure, that would be great. Councillor Toppelberg. I have great, great interest, but no, no interest to declare as such. Um, on page 21, um, and I guess it's a question to the CEO. Page 21, item 2.8 deals with underground power. And it seems to me that we, well, the question, it's been on the council priorities previously. We've had a commitment or a commitment to the community previously to consult and to devise a plan or otherwise. And it seems to just, uh, I'm questioning its inclusion in here given that it hasn't been dealt with either under the SCP uh, strategic community plan uh, or corporate business plan appropriately and we'd just like some feedback as to whether uh, administration think it's appropriate to be throwing something like this out there into the public realm that effectively we have responsibility or it, it, it's within our remit to potentially solve this problem uh, when my understanding is that we've proven time and again that we have neither the capacity to, to do so nor the plan to do so currently. So just curious about its inclusion and um, whether you think it's appropriate to be in this space? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, administration did actually carefully consider that. Um, back in, I think it was November 2015, there was a comprehensive discussion paper that was presented to a then open um, council forum and that discussed the pros and cons and estimated costs of rolling out an undergrounding power program throughout the whole of the city. Councillor Tobelberg's comment that um, we don't have a plan or a strategy or the capacity to implement something like that at this stage or even for the foreseeable future is entirely valid. In this particular instance, um, administration felt it would be appropriate to include the action item to simply undertake a cost-benefit analysis, so basically do an investigation as to the viability, costs, consequences, etc., of implementing town centre specific undergrounding measures to actually um, improve the amenity and streetscape feel in clearly defined spaces of our town centres rather than across the city as a whole. 
We hoped that through the Imagine Vincent exercise, um, any community members who felt passionately about the subject would raise the issue. Um, it was very rarely raised, and even then it was only raised primarily in the context of town centres and in the context of street tree preservation and to allow further growth of street trees. Um, on that basis, um, my opinion is that including that action item is fair and reasonable because we also know that it has come up from town centre focus groups and conversations among town teams in the past. So we felt it would be appropriate to at least close the loop on that, conclude a proper cost-benefit analysis just so that we better understand what the um, costs and impacts and benefits are and then make a decision as to what, if anything, is going to be done with that. Um, but do so in a way that doesn't um, unduly create expectation that um, the city is actually going to go ahead and do any of that work. We first need to understand its costs and benefits. Through you, Mayor Cole, if I might just add to that, um, as, the, as the CEO said, um, the action in this case is a cost-benefit analysis of undergrounding power. I note that the attachment in the council report is not the version um, that was signed off. Um, so for some reason there's an incorrect attachment here and, and that action is specifically different. So if you have a look at the electronic version that was emailed through earlier, I'm sure that that will be the correct version. You'll, you'll note well, just that 2.8 so is different. On that it says here, because you're saying a cost-benefit analysis is the action, it says here, therefore a strategy to underground power is necessary. Those read like two... Are you saying that this, this is not... The, the strategy to underground power is not what's required? It should actually say a cost-benefit analysis of potentially undergrounding power is the action? Yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, so I didn't even recognise that because the version that was signed off on as the final draft did not include those words. Um, that's an error that administration will need to correct. Thank you so for just raising it. Further to that then, and I'll just ask, up until 2012-13, uh, and particularly with the inclusion of a, uh, a member on the Metro West JDAP, uh, up until that point the city had successfully uh, applied a planning condition for pretty much every development with nil setback over three storeys, which effectively covers most town centres, to require the undergrounding of power as part of the planning approval. Uh, that was, as to the best of my knowledge, only ever challenged once uh, successfully with a development on Ango Street, at which point we actually, I think we tried to actually uh, apply a condition such that they would contribute at a later date to a uh, communal fund uh, um, and we did investigate opportunities to do it by policy to actually have a uh, cash in lieu requirement or otherwise to do it collectively but did we ever get legal advice in relation to the validity of the planning condition because I know it was subsequently removed from all DAP applications just because one of the DAP members said that they wouldn't support it because it required uh, the uh, it required the, the uh, if it was a third party uh, asset or otherwise but I as I say, from, to my knowledge, it had been successfully applied by the city for as long as the city existed prior to that. Did, can we check if we ever did get that legal advice? And if so, uh, can we see if it, such a condition would perhaps be valid? Yes. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Um, I can take that on notice and provide that information. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Oh, through you, Mayor, just in relation to item 1.2 of the North Perth Town Centre Place Plan, which relates to the Woodville Reserve Master Plan, um, I believe I've asked this previously, but just querying um, uh, the reasoning behind including um, an item um, that actually exists outside the North Perth Town Centre Place Plan boundary, as indicated in the document? Through you, Mayor Cole, Woodville Reserve is considered to be a fundamental um, green space associated with the North Perth Town Centre and that was the reason why it was included even though it's outside of the boundary. People that use the Town Centre um, do also use Woodville Reserve and so because of that connection um, it was included in the recommendations for the North Perth Place Plan. So just following on from that, is there intention to include within other Town Centre Place Plans um, items from the Corporate Business Plan? that may also relate to adjacent open space? Through you, Mayor Cole, it will depend on the town centre and the amount of open space in that town centre and whether there's a need. And through 
the process of developing the place plan, we identify there's a need for um, additional work to be done on surrounding open spaces or new open spaces um, in the vicinity. So when we, we don't want to be bound by um, the boundary that we've drawn for the town centre because it really depends on um, what improves and helps develop that town centre, irrelevant of where it's located in the context of the boundary. Councillors, Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, to the Director of Development Services. Just um, with the ordering of the volumes um, that's set there, are they the order in which they're going to be delivered or has that already been set as a priority? Through you, Mayor Cole, it hasn't been set by Council, but that's the intention, is for um, each of the Town Centre's place plans to be developed as has been set out in the order in the volume series. Just to follow on to that question, is that on the basis of readiness to go, given that some of the place plans also incorporate the town centre action plans? Is that one of the rationales? That's correct, along with um, the fact that for Leaderville, um, we're looking, we're commencing the activity centre plan um, this financial year, and so it's important that we do that together with. Um, the, the place plan, um, but yes, in, in relation, it mainly relates to the action plans prepared by the, um, the town teams and how ready each of those are to be incorporated into a place plan. Thank you, council members. Um, Director, I was just going to mention I did spot some typos, but it may be because we didn't have the correct version. But <laughs> just, to, just to raise that it would be good if someone could just do a sweep through of the final version prior to advertising. Absolutely, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're moving um, away from development services now onto technical services. Item 6.1. I'll just wait for the council members to return because we are missing a couple of council members before we get into, into this. Okay, we're now into technical services with the first item 6.1, Hyde Park Oblong Turtle Population Study. Questions? Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, uh, uh, this might be a difficult question to answer, but I guess I observed that we've had this information and work that's been going on for a while now and basically not noticed any replacement to the turtle population um, in Hyde Park. Given they're all getting older progressively, there's still a number that are fertile. Is there a point where we cease to have any fertile turtles and effectively the species will just die out in that area? Is that, is that something that we know when that might occur by, given it's been such a long time that we've had replacement population? Uh, through the Chair, that is a distinct possibility unless we find the cause for the decline in the, um, the hatchling population. So. But that hasn't been um, identified or specified as to when we think that may occur. So hopefully the continuing study will give us further guidance on that. Councillors, Councillor Gondoszewski. Oh, just, just one more. A note from the report that um, there appears to be similar declines in other po turtle populations across the metropolitan area. And just wondering if there's other studies of this nature being conducted um, uh, uh, particularly in relation to identifying if there's difference um, between ours and other populations that are undertaking decline, um, given that it looked as though ours was related to um, nest pr or predation or nest destruction. Uh, through the chair, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll take it on notice and certainly find out. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, we'll move along to item 6.2, item 6.2, which is proposed traffic calming on Randall Street, Perth. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, more gen general question. Can we ask the Road Safety Advisory Group perhaps to come back to Council with a general suite of non-speed hump traffic calming measures, just so we've got something else to choose from? Because it seems that we often get humps or no humps, but as opposed to, no, these are some 
and some just non-location specific, but if we could get a report in the next couple of months um, from the advisory group just saying these are things that work globally and different things to consider, because, I, I, yeah, that would be appreciated. Uh, through the chair, the uh, uh, previous RSAG, and what are we now, the Urban Mobility Advisory Group, <laughs> have discussed that in general. That's not so yet been adopted by council, but there's <laughs> hope. <laughs> Uh, we have discussed that, and yes, we, will, we certainly are looking at alternative treatments other than speed humps. Director, it might also be useful to just address the issue of, um, it's not really a matrix, but the um, if you could just talk us through the discussion that we had at RSAG around um, the, the sort of assessment that, that we would um, put these proposals through prior to them coming back to Council. Uh, through you, uh, Madam uh, Mayor Cole. We've been discussing in general terms that the RSAG, a warrant system, which is quite common across local government, it's essentially, it um, takes a, a number of scenarios and gives them a, uh, affords them a score, and then we set a minimum criteria that we think that should be uh, some degree of intervention. So obviously, if it falls way short of that, then we're less inclined to make any physical intervention if it exceeds that, uh, depending on the the uh, degree that exceeds it as to the level of intervention we'd consider and then we obviously consult with the public. Thank you, Director. Councillor Hallott. Uh, just a couple of questions through you, Mayor Cole, to Acting Director of Technical Services. Um, one, do we have a timeline for that road resurfacing that's planned for the street? Uh, through the Chair, um, we're in the process of finalising our resurfacing It'll be more than likely early in the new year. Um, and ha have the applicants who attended the RSAG meeting um, to propose this, have they been contacted and um, were they briefed prior to the um, agenda going out? Uh, through the chair, no, unfortunately. I just made a note to myself that, that we hadn't contacted and we'll make sure we do tomorrow morning. And thank you. To, oh, sorry, Councillor Hallett. Just to follow up on that, um, in the discussion, I think it would be worthwhile um, raising the line marking, as um, you know, resurfacing and line marking as um, the form of treatment that that is um, proposed. In addition to their um, request for the speed humps, which is the point that that council will need to determine. Councillor Hallett, sorry, did you have a further question? Um, and just, would you be able to just clarify the contents of the consultation pack? Um, was it just the map that we saw in attachment two, um, or did it include other kind of um, diagrams and, um, I guess, rationale for um, what was being proposed? Uh, through the chair, it was predominantly the standard uh, consultational feedback letter with a copy of the drawing that you're referring to, and with an explanation of the traffic data that we'd taken at the time. Any further questions? Okay. Moving on to 6.3, late report, Safe Active Streets, Bike Boulevard, Progress, Report 3. Are there any questions on this item? Councillor Loden. Um, there's, I guess, three parts to the questions I have. Um, so the, it's around um, the trees that we're planting down along the Bike Boulevard how we're managing the crossovers for the major intersections and um, around the zigzag orientation that you get in and parking, sorry. Um, so my understanding is that from the previous reports that the more you can get the roads to zig back and forth, the better it is from a traffic calming point of view. So I was just wondering why on Francis, between, along the street between Francis and Tennyson, Galway and Burke, and also for most of Richmond and Burke, the two sideways pieces, we haven't included more of that sort of zigzagging back and forth. Uh, through the chair, um, in the vicinity of, the, of Aranmore College, we had that discussion with the school, and we have a lot of uh, non degree parking at that point. So we didn't want to start playing with the current traffic patterns that's been well established, and also because people are obviously reversing out into the uh, traffic lane. We've got to maintain the full six metres. So at that point, we thought it warranted staying relatively straight. The other part of Scott Street, the parking restrictions south of you know, south of uh, Tennyson Street were only established approximately two years ago. So we didn't want to now to dislocate the parking that we've only just 
recently, uh, and that's also the place we've got an opportunity to plant the trees. And I, I don't know the variety of them, but I can certainly find out for you in that respect. Um, and then, I guess, continuing on from that, it appears like there isn't any allocated on-street bays in those sections as well. Is that because they're all off, like, uh, ver effectively nose-in verge parking in those sections? Uh, through the chair, Richmond Street's certainly going to retain the uh, parallel parking on the northern side. Southern side, adjacent the Loftus Centre car park, is all 90 degree parking. So we've got to maintain the uh, essentially the six metre aisle, which is the red asphalt. And then I guess specifically between Francis and Tennyson, it looks like it's just a single red strip without any allocated base. So is there um, parallel parking in those sections? Uh, through the chair, um, Tennyson, I know from the Francis, which direction we're going. It's, um, we've got Galway but south of that, and then we've got Richmond Street. I was just trying to get a handle on which portion we're talking about. So if you look at the sheet one, it's basically the middle chunk um, of Shakespeare Street between Franklin and um, Marin Street. There's just, it there's, doesn't seem to be any bay compared to the other parts. Uh, sorry, sorry yeah, that, that's the section I was referring to at Aaron Moore College. Um, it's actually, that's where the 90 degree parking is on the southern side or on the bottom of that drawing. It's all 90 degree angle parking on the school and the church at that point. So we've maintained the full width of the road pavement in the red asphalt. So then on the topic of trees, um, we've put in a chunk down Scott Street, um, but it seems if you look along the length of Shakespeare Street, there's a number of holes in that, looking at from a, a sort of satellite image um, between Burke and Richmond and, um, and Wilberforce and Anzac, and Marion and Tennyson as well. So there's a few different holes that could be plugged there. Um, is it possible to consider including putting some more trees in those sections? Uh, through the chair, most definitely. Um, in general, we thought that section of Shakespeare Street was well, for want of a better description, treed, but certainly Scott Street's a bit barren. So yes, but we can look at filling in any holes that may be there. And also particularly down the on the western side of Burke Street, um, there isn't really any trees on the bit that's just south of the park. Um, now, I guess some of them are informal parking bays as well, but maybe on the southern side or something, it would be good to include some there if possible. Certainly we can reassess the trees for the full length of the route, yeah. I, mean, I guess more broadly it's just in the context of our um, tree, our um, greening plan, we sort of have this sort of certain distance between trees to try and create that full canopy along the length. Um, and then the other one is, um, how do we cross, how do, how do the bikes get across Scarborough Beach Road, across Anzac and across Burke Street? Uh, through the chair, Scarborough Beach Road is probably the most difficult crossing. Um, while the clarity is not great, you can see there that we're going to extend the red strip through as a visual uh, cue to drivers that there's something happening in the middle of the road. We, of the impression that the confident riders will continue to stay on road on their bike, the less confident ones will use the uh, widened um, refuge islands. There's existing islands there now, what's proposed, as I said, it's a bit hard to see in this detail, those islands will be widened to the appropriate or to the correct standards in respect of the depth of the, the refuge. So the width will be that of, so theoretically someone riding down Scarborough Beach Road will be able to see that there's no traffic coming in a easterly direction, go across to the island and their bike will fit within, their full length of their bike will fit within that traffic island space and then they can then figure out how to navigate across there. Yeah, through the chair, that's, that's correct. Uh, then, just in terms of uh, going down um, the intersections of uh, Burke and Rich... Oh, sorry, I'm getting myself confused around here in my notes. Um, when we cross over the Burke intersection and Anzac Street, um, we seem to be prioritising flow going in an east-west direction rather than a north-south direction. Is there an option to change that around? Was there any reason why we did it that way rather than effectively making the priority direction for flow the, the bike path 
direction, in like a north-south orientation, to help ensure slowing of those people travelling in an east-westerly direction. Uh, through the chair, the Anzac at that point is still a local distributor road, so technically it has priority. Um, it was also, I suppose, to make cyclists a bit more cautious because you're coming over the crest of the hill as you're heading north, so it's an opportunity for them to slow down and that can be changed. One of the discussions we'll have with main roads is changing it to a giveaway. So legally, obviously, cyclists then can continue without coming to a complete stop. And then similarly at Burke Street, the intersection of Scarborough Beach Road and, oh, sorry, um, Shakespeare Street and Burke Street. Uh, through the chair, uh, a similar scenario, Burke Street's obviously um, district distributor B Road, so it has the priority over the um, Scott, what is Scott Street at that point. Thank you. Council members. Um, Director, I did have a couple of questions. Just wanted to talk about or ask a question about the consultation, and I notice that this will mainly be dealt with through PACs being distributed to residents and that the phase one had quite an extensive and intensive consultation which included a forum and on-site consultation with residents. Do you feel that this approach will be um, sufficient for phase two in that there's not, forum hasn't for example been arranged? Through the chair, we anticipate that we will actually meet individuals and or groups if that's what they prefer to, to actually walk through specific locations on the route and talk about what can and can't be achieved and from the rationale behind it. So we didn't think it was necessary to have a, a community forum as such but certainly meet with uh, residents and individuals if there's need arises. Okay thank you and I also just wanted to check with the slow points. I know that um, we've had this discussion where they're at grade um, at the at Phase one, Shakespeare Street, whereas the um, Bayswater option had the curbing around trees. What um, will be proposed for this um, scenario with the slow points? Uh, the mid-block slow points will be more based on the uh, Bayswater scenario and the intersections will be plateaus. And the intersections, unlike Bayswaters, will be you know, curb to curb so that the pedestrian doesn't have to do that dip down and then come back up. So. So just note that um, it has been reported to me that the slow points at the top end, because they are at, at grade, they're not necessarily being um, treated as slow points any longer. Sorry, through the chair, I misunderstood. Yes, there will be a um, semi-mountable curb as opposed to a flush curb, so it will actually prevent the drivers from driving over them. Thank you, Director. Any further questions? Okay. Um, corporate services, item 7.1, funding request for replacement of corroded structural columns at the Azuri Bocce Club at 3 Lawley Street, uh, West Perth. Any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Lowden. Um, so we've got the three quotes and they all seem to be equivalent. Um, it it seems seemed strange that ferret boiler making is like almost a third the price of um, Devco. And Devco is also our usual provider, who we usually go for, to for all this stuff. So um, they seem to be quite high cost. Uh, do you have any comments on that? I guess uh, through the chair, we uh, certainly have verified that the scope of work that each quoted on was the same, and they all had the same understanding, and that the lower priced quote does indeed cover the full cost of the works and um, we are assured that it does so um, we, we have no reason to believe that it will does not cover the, the cost of the they may well just have lower overheads uh, through you mayor cole just in relation to the comment about devco um, devco has been appointed through a tender to from memory do the small small maintenance contract and that was for prices specified as part of their tender submission. And this is an entirely different project altogether, so not captured as part of that. 
Council members? May I add, uh, if I may, something to that? Um, Devco would have subcontracted this work out, whereas uh, Ferret Boyle are making are a specialist firm, and that's part of the difference in price. Thank you, Director. Um, no further questions. So moving on to 7.2, late report, investment report as at the 31st of October 2017. Questions? Councillor Lowden? You don't even need to raise your hand. Just wanted to confirm that um, the investment, a review of the investment uh, policy is coming to the next council workshop. Is that the case? I believe it's been confirmed in two emails, Councillor Lowden, but we can check with the director if you wish. Uh, through the chair, that is certainly my understanding, yes, and we've got it uh, scheduled. Any further questions on the investment report? Okay, we'll move on to item 7.3, authorisation of expenditure for the period 23rd of September 2017 to 19th of October 2017. Any questions? Councillor Gonczewski? I'm happy to take this one on notice, but just um, if we could get some additional detail through you to the Director of Development Services in relation to the costs for SAT representation. Um, and also, um, a note we've just uh, purchased new dog litter bags and there was, yeah, there was some discussions about biodegradable and I was just wondering whether that had, ad had eventuated. Through the chair, I don't actually know, but I'll find out. <laughs> I was actually going to ask that it was a reasonable expenditure on dog litter bags. Yep. Councillor Tuppelberg. Um, just, just to note that the, uh, I think the ICT allowance has been noted as part of the council meeting fee for elected members, which it's not. So just asking if that can maybe be separated out, um, because the ICT allowance is separate to our meeting fees. We have confirmation from the director. Yes. Any further questions on expenditure? Okay. Financial statements 7.4, financial statements as at the 30th of September. Any questions, Councillor Lowden? Just in terms of our tracking of capital expenditure, we seem to be tracking quite w well below trend and there's obviously a number of projects that have sort of started a bit late. There seems to be an awful large number of them starting in October. Um, so I just wanted to get a feel for are we, how confident are we that we're actually going to um, spend the capex that's been allocated this year. Sorry, through the chair. Um, we're just um, arcing up the uh, resurfacing program now, which is obviously a very large part of the expenditure. We're in the process of programming the three biggest jobs for probably February next year, which would be the uh, regional road re uh, resurfacing, Angove Street, pretty well the full length from Charles to Fitzgerald Street, and also Fitzgerald from Raglan to Burt Street. So there's a sizeable chunk and we're working through a lot of the smaller ones that haven't been reflected in the accounts at this stage, so yes. Councillor Toppelberg. Um, either to the Director of uh, Community uh, Engagement or to the uh, Director of Corporate Services, can I ask what's going on at Beatty Park? The numbers seem to be uh, still worrisome. Uh, and. Uh, more, more so because I don't have it in front of me here, but the divergence from budget more so than uh, than the actual uh, numbers themselves. But I'll, if you need specifics, I'll get to it in a sec. But um. through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we've actually been performing pretty well at Beattie Park in the financial report as of 30 uh, September identifies an operating deficit of $173,000 as opposed to the budgeted deficit of $214,000. So what I was looking at was the 30 September, so I'll come back to you on it. Okay, we'll give you more time. Does anyone want to ask a question to fill in while Councillor Toppelberg looks up his data? Let's have some hold music. Um, yeah, so I've got the cash, uh, I've got the year to date 17 18 budget uh, showing the cash surplus 
budgeted to be 78,000 and then the actuals to be 116,949 in the red. Have I read that wrongly? So uh, through the chair, uh, it's a hundred and sixteen thousand dollar surplus cash versus a budget of a seventy eight thousand dollar deficit. So we're actually ahead at the um, net position. So, so it's a it's a red deficit. Thank you. That might have been the version that was supposed to be replaced. <laughs> okay. um, any further questions on the financial reports? Um, we'll move on to community engagement. Item 8.1, the Loftus Community Centre request for waiver and write-off of fees. Any questions on this one? Councillor Lodham. Uh, just looking at the recommendation, um, the rent seems to not have a time frame associated with it. I think it's supposed to be per year. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yes, it is uh, per annum. So that would be uh, prorated for the, the, the tenure of the, of the lease. So it just mean, do we need to actually include that specifically in the recommendation? So it says r rent will remain at uh, 1,303, including GSD, to be indexed at CPI. Um, do we need to specify that it's actually a year, that, that, that time frame, just to make it clear in the recommendation? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we will make that amendment for clarity. Thank you. Any further questions on the Loftus Community Centre? Um, Director, I just wanted to ask whether um, would the waivers have all been laid out, etc., and then the requirement is to pay the $10,389 um, is there, um, has the Loftus Community Centre indicated that they have the capacity to pay that amount? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, particularly over the last uh, few weeks and months we've been directly engaging with Loftus Community Centre around administration's expectations of, of what they um, need to pay. Um, and I'm actually quite glad in a way that they're not, not here tonight, which, um, which does actually reflect um, a positive meeting that the Acting Manager of Community Partnerships had with them last week, where they were fully understanding and, and we shared the report recommendations with them. Thank you. Um, Councillor Loden. I was going to call you Director Loden. <laughs> Um, just wondering if in the future then this might be a potential site for co-location, given their operations tend to be during the day, if there's somebody that could be using it in the evening or something like that? Through you, Mayor Cole, that is uh, one of the key reasons why we've been seeking uh, Loftus Community Centre Inc. to undertake an organisational review. Um, an exclusive long-term lease is not necessarily what's required for a community group to operate effectively. So uh, it's why we're hopeful that um, once they have their organisational review in February next year, we can start to look at it with them um, to identify what are the, the, the building tenure arrangements that they need to be able to effectively operate. And if that isn't an exclusive use, then that, that obviously opens itself up to other groups, either through licence arrangements, hire agreements or, or some other forms. So certainly the intent um, is to maximise utilisation of the community centre. And so um, that, that is a core part of the organisational review. Council members. OK. Move on then to item 8.2, Manor Inc. A review of the use of World Square for the provision of free meal services for the homeless. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Community Engagement, could you just confirm the reasoning behind um, the six month extension for Manor Inc? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, there were two primary reasons for that. Uh, in the last month, uh, the City received correspondence from Manor Inc identifying that uh, due to some financial difficulties, they would need to drop one of their free meal service days, which means there's no longer a service on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, secondary to that, uh, identifying either directly or through uh, advice from Manor Inc or other agencies we've had observing the site, it appears that there are a number of well-meaning organisations who are, are commencing the provision of services at World Square. So uh, upon 
discussing that with Manorink and with the Salvation Army, we saw fit to uh, provide a shorter term agreement to give some of the key stakeholders, including the city, some time to sit around the table and discuss a more consolidated approach. Um, having said that, uh, we certainly very much see Manorink um, as part of of whatever that consolidated approach is and, and their free meal service continuing. Um, but because there were a few issues up in the air, we discussed with them only a six month approval um, and we met with them again as late as this afternoon and their understanding of, of that view on the basis of, I guess, the rationale behind it from the city's perspective. Councillors, Councillor Lode and then Councillor Toppleberg. My assumption is the intent behind this is that in sometime in the next six months, um, Manor Inc. would then co-move to somewhere else with, uh, through a joint delivery with some other provider, is that right? Through you, Mayor Cole, no. The intention is that uh, at this point in time, Manor Inc. will continue to deliver the service from World Square. What we're trying to do is get a better handle on um, how do we need a service on weekends? And if so, how is that best delivered? And so uh, an example of what may come back to Council is Manor Inc. continuing to provide their free meal service Monday to Friday, but Salvation Army, for example, providing that service on Saturdays and Sundays. So the intention is for administration to bring back a consolidated report to identify what agencies will be providing a service or agency providing a service from World Square. In administration's view, what we don't want is four, five, six different agencies providing a range of services at World Square because that um, does certainly bring with it some risk in terms of impacting the, the park amenity for surrounding residents and businesses. Just following up from, how confident are you that we will be able to get to that resolution point within the next six months? And could we instead consider a longer term approval and then if it's resolved quicker, they can transition to that, but rather than potentially being here six months down the track and going, oh, we need an extra month to sort it out? Through you, Mayor Cole, following consultation with Manor Inc and Salvation Army and Noongar Outreach Services, I'm very confident that we'll have a report back um, in May. Uh, it works well from Manor Inc's perspective because they are going through some, some organisational challenges. Um, so I think they would rather come to grips with what they can actually provide um, in the short term rather than uh, the medium term. Thank you. Um, the, so th when this was approved, not last time, but the time before, there was a, a key element of the, or one of the elements of the approval related to uh, Manor Inc actively seeking alternative locations. Um, and my understanding, and I understand why we haven't gone to community consultation with this, but just further to Councillor Loden's question, if we are looking at changing the service potentially and effectively council removing the requirement or the request for Manor Inc to look at alternative locations, so effectively recognising World Square as the place within the City of Vincent to provide uh, food services for people who are experiencing homelessness, given that that would likely require community consultation. I'm a bit iffy about us being able to be back within six months, but I guess the, the uh, is the administration satisfied that we've had that conversation with community in that we are now not requiring Manor Inc to seek alternative location or otherwise? Because as I say, I understand why we didn't go out to consult for the extension here, but uh, I'd be reticent to, to I don't think, I don't think the intent of the original approval is captured in removing that requirement if we're just looking at this as a transition to a permanent seven day a week service within uh, World Square. Just, uh, does the time frame uh, allow for community consultation in relation to that? And is, is administration satisfied that, uh, that we, or do we even need to consult in relation to it? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, as per the most recent council resolution from November last year, there is no longer um, a requirement from either council or administration for Manor Inc to continue to look for um, alternative accommodation. So that hasn't been considered as part of uh, this particular recommendation. Uh, and I'll reserve judgment on what administration brings back to council in terms of the length of any um, consolidated approval um, from May onwards. But my expectation was given 
um, the idiosyncrasies and the, uh, the, the challenges around this site. Um, I wouldn't have thought administration will be looking to recommend a, a long-term agreement. I think there is validity in um, continual review and, and whether it be 12 months or similar um, length agreements so that we can continue to, to monitor issues and, and change things effectively. So in my view, the, the, the type of recommendation that was envisaged to come back in May would be very similar, a time-limited approval, um, albeit it may indeed still just include Manor Inc or it may include um, other agencies. So just to follow up, on, in the report it mentioned the, um, that previous condition around um, looking for alternative locations and that um, it was decided that there wasn't an, an alternative um, and in particular that an indoor location would be, um, an NGO wouldn't be capable of, I guess, covering the costs of that. Um, was that the only reason that indoor sites were, I guess, um, discontinued? The, my understanding is the two key reasons were, one, the costs associated um, for an organisation like Manor Inc with, with a, I guess, an indoor venue, um, and also just their, their capability to secure such a venue in relatively close population to where the homeless um, are within inner city Perth. Having said that, I know um, from speaking to Manor Inc today that they are actively looking to relocate um, their, their current base in Vic Park. Um, so they are actively looking to, to relocate um, where they're looking to relocate to, I don't know, at this point in time. So, but Manor Inc are still looking to, uh, privy, to be as close as possible to where they're delivering their services, but obviously it needs to be um, financial for, for a not-for-profit organisation like themselves. Do they have any interest in a cottage across the road? Depends whether it's leasing or purchasing that cottage. But um, look, certainly I'm not I'm not fully across what uh, what infrastructure requirements and Manor Inc um, have. Uh, but certainly it's a valid point in terms of looking at the, the city's building stock more broadly to see whether um, any any might be appropriate. But I suspect that that was investigated as part of the, the previous um, research by administration. Councillors. Um, Director, I just wanted to ask further to your response in relation to the six-month proposed time frame. Is this something that Manor Inc is accepting of or requesting? Through you, Mayor Cole, accepting of. So their preference would be for the usual 12-month extension? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, they're in the process of, uh, they have a, now a, a new board um, and either a new CEO or a new acting CEO. So they're actively uh, looking to get more support from the private sector in terms of funding. So uh, they did have mentioned to us that their preference is for a 12-month approval just so it makes it a little bit easier for them to go and secure um, some of that funding. Um, so that, that is uh, their preference from, from that perspective. Having said that, um, they are have fully brought into the, the process of discussing with some key agencies this Collins consolidated approach and um, have no problems apart from that sponsorship side of things with a, with a six month approval. Um, if we were, if council was to amend to 12 months, I'm not quite sure how that would be of detriment to other services providing a weekend service. Can you elaborate on that? I'm, why that would be a problem? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, there is no problem as such. Um, we could continue to, we could do this review with other agencies whilst um, Manor Inc have a 12-month approval and, and if we happen to reach a different outcome before that 12 months, bring a, a report back to Council. So there is no risk from that perspective. It was really just um, putting a definitive time frame more so on administration and the agencies we'll consult with to um, give this some genuine consideration within a reasonable time frame and, and come back with a solution. Um, I might just flag an amendment to move to a 12-month approval. Oh, not that I'm able to move it, but I'll ask for one to be put on the table for consideration. Are there any further questions? Okay, moving on. Um, Item 8.3, adoption of the Dog Amendment Local Law, 2007. Any questions? Councillor Murphy. 
Um, yeah, in the report it mentions the Dog Act allows penalties of up to $5,000 for dog attacks. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to check uh, through the Chair if you could clarify if it was a desire of Council um, if we could increase the fine for a dog attack a causing, si causing significant injury up to a maximum of $5,000 within that Act. Does that make sense? So the Dog Act because in the report it mentions the Dog Act allows penalties for up to $5,000 for dog attacks, but in, um, I think it's uh, attachment four, it mentions the current fine is $400. Um, but I'm wondering if, if we were to increase that, would, would we be able to go up to $5,000 if, if that was the, the will of Council? Through Mayor Kyle, I will just take them notice to, to confirm why there is that anomaly. Having said that, the, the penalties within the Dog Act um, sit above our, our local law and therefore uh, those, those provisions or those fines within the, the Dog Act are enforceable at that $5,000 level. Um, I will just take that on notice and just seek clarity why there is a difference between those two figures. And just one more. So, also, would you be able to clarify what a dog attack causing significant injury would be? An example. Mayor Kyle, I'll, I'll take that on notice and provide a response in the briefing notes. Councillor Hallett. Also, just a clarification to make sure that I'm, I'm reading it correctly. Um, there was a comment around um, the Dog Act and that the default interpretation of the law is that businesses that are open to the public are a public place. Um, so does that mean the businesses that don't want dogs to enter their premises will need to have signage specifically saying that? Through you, Mayor Cole, strictly speaking, yes, that is, that is correct. Councillor Hallett. Has ad ad admin given, I guess, consideration around, I guess, communication to um, business community around what, what um, might be then required from them. Through you, Mayor Cole, it's certainly a valid point and, and something that if indeed that uh, change to the local law goes through, I think it would be prudent for administration to at least provide businesses with some guidance in that regard because uh, I, I doubt there is a broad understanding of the implications of that at this point. Councillor Toppelberg. Um, in response to the uh, 1.2 about dog exercise areas, administration says it's of the view that the current number of dog exercise areas is appropriate. Um, can we, and happy for you to take it on notice, when people, can you tell me where in the city, uh, other than currently Hyde Street Reserve, but that's about to change, where can people go if they don't want to be around dogs on or off leash? So what, what public space do we have that people can access where dogs are prohibited currently? Through me, Cole, I'll take that on notice. Do you include on-leash dogs in that question? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, yeah. Well, we can separate separate the two, but I know that there are some people in the community who uh, don't like to be, be yeah, in the company of dogs on or off-leash, and uh, I, I think the answer to it is none. But I'd just like to know if we if if there are any spaces that we currently have where uh, dogs are not prohibited. Well, Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. I think that will be on notice that one. Um, just in relation to the Councillor Hullett's question, Director, about, um, about businesses having to have signage, could we potentially talk to marketing about whether we could have a sticker campaign for, you know, I mean, obviously there'd be some expense, but, you know, we have an in-house graphic designer, potentially we could do something for business. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's, I will certainly look at that. It's, um would have merit, I would have thought. Sorry, can I just seek some clarity? Yes. Somebody who has tenancy or ownership over a private, over a premises is entitled, as I understand it, to deny access to anybody to that, onto that premises, whether they are a shop or otherwise. So I w I'm certain that you don't have to have sign. Somebody is, is not contravening the Dog Act, but certainly the, the owner of the property or the tenant or otherwise just needs to say, I don't want dog, it just needs to be it's not an entitlement, it's not a public place. It's publicly accessible, but it's not a public place. It's private property that we're referring to. I would have thought that it, it seems odd 
that unless you have a, unless you have signage informing people that they have a right to bring their dog on private premises. Through you, Mayor Coles, signage is not um, obligatory for, for any business. It's certainly a, uh, a more readily available tool that a, a, a shop or a business could quite easily advise their customers whether dogs are um, permitted or not. Um, but it certainly could be verbally from a, from a business or a private property owner's perspective if, if they so desired. Um, obviously, with the Dog Act provisions no longer um, enabling the, the city to prevent access to public places and more so those private shops um, and similar that, that fall under that same definition, it would, um, that, that's where it really is. It falls into trespassing and different legislation as opposed to um, the Dog Act or, or indeed the city's local law. Any further questions on the Dog Act or local law? Okay. Um, moving to the uh, Chief Executive Officer items, um, just to mention also that we have dealt with item 8.4, Florida Athena Football Club, earlier in the meeting. That was the first item that we dealt with. So we're moving now on to 9.1, appointment of council members to advisory and working groups and external bodies. Councillors, are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you to the CEO. Um, can I just confirm that the terms of reference that are there for the proposed um, transport slash urban mobility um, advisory group, is, is that a draft and can amendments be made to that at the first meeting of the actual group and then come back to council to um, get ratified? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, council sets the terms of reference. Um, notwithstanding, any advisory or working group at any time can propose or recommend to council changes to the terms of reference that apply to their group. And yes, the version that's attached is absolutely a, just a draft for council's consideration. Councillors, Councillor Gondoshevsky. I've, I've lost my place, but it was in the recommendation and it was relating to, and now my bookmarks aren't working, um, that it was in relation to um, the review of the terms of reference to um, note the council membership on the groups would be two, and I think on somewhere are now saying that they could be three. I'm just going to go and find it. Come here, sir. Um, I believe that was probably in response to an email that I sent around um, that was in relation to the fact that when we had eight council members, we managed to have two council members per advisory group, but now that we have a full complement of council members that was getting difficult and that um, there was some expressions of interest made at a workshop for council members involvement in um, participating on these working groups and it became evident that it was not going to be possible to meet two for each group. Um, yes, so is, um, should we then amend um, point, well, so we will amend point four of the recommendation. Yeah, thanks. Councillors. Okay, thank you. Moving on to 9.2, late report draft CEO performance review policy. Questions? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, through you to the CEO. Um, I had mentioned uh, to you previously about finding ways to encourage uh, elected members and senior staff to, uh, well, maybe not encourage is maybe a softer word than what I'd mentioned previously, but make it incumbent upon them to actually participate in the feedback process. Would that be something that would be most appropriately, and I've had a look, um, so there's a clause in the Code of Conduct which uh, reads, uh, council members and employees will give effect to the lawful policies of the local government whether or not they agree with or approve of them, and so it basically says that whatever, the, they have to adhere to the policies that, uh, that exist. Would this be the appropriate place to, uh, um, to make it, uh, to voice the expectation of people to participate in the process or would it be better served through the Code of Conduct itself? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, not exactly an easy question to answer, but in short, um, I would say if Council wanted to attempt to mandate that, it would be best done through this policy because this policy would then provide the guidance for that to which the Code of Conduct would be referencing. However, in relation to staff participation in a feedback on the CEO's performance, um, 
given that staff participation is entirely confidential, neither council members nor I nor the recruitment consultant will know the identity of who has or has not participated. Um, I suggest it would be near on impossible to ascertain um, of a pool of staff that were invited to participate in a survey which of them did or did not participate. So enforcement would become a problem there. I think the similar principle might apply to um, council members unless, of course, council members felt comfortable sharing with the um, CEO performance review panel um, which council members have or have not participated in the survey. Well, I'll speak more next week to the statistical accuracy, but I, um, I will, it would now be the appropriate forum to uh, foreshadow the amendment, or should I just email it around? It would do, well, it'll be to insert a new 3.7, which basically um, identifies that there's an expectation to provide feedback. The nature of that feedback I'll speak more to next week. It, doesn't, it can be neutral or uh, non-participatory, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that next week. Thank you for flagging the amendment. Um, are you suggesting that you'll be emailed email the wording through? Thank you, Councillor Topperberg. Councillor Loden. Uh, two queries. The first one's a minor one. Um, under 1.3 states the panel will be made up of the mayor plus three other councillors. Um, is there merit in including some flexibility similar to the advisory committees that it's up to three councillors in case? We can't co-opt three councillors into being on the uh, the panel. I don't have an issue with that. I think that could come forward as an amendment, um, unless administration wishes to deal with it in another way. Um, through you, Mayor Cole. Look, I'll take guidance from council on that. The only comment I would add is that, under that circumstance, it's foreseeable that the panel would comprise the mayor and one other council member and whether or not council would then be satisfied with the responsibilities and obligations of the panel that are set out in this policy then being managed by um, just a lesser number of council members. I think it would have its pros and its cons but that's for council to provide direction on. And my second one was just around the, how the, the process works um, based around the CEO's anniversary. And I note that there's part 4.1 that talks about aligning this to um, a financial year. Given the corporate business plan, our budget, a lot of our planning and everything operates on a financial year, this, is that now, that's basically the intent behind this 4.1 that will effectively align it to a financial year eventually? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that's the intent. Um, in the conversation that the Mayor and I had um, following the panel's discussion to just fine-tune the policy prior to submission to Council, we discussed that it would be advantageous because all of our other corporate performance reporting and soon-to-be SCP reporting will be based on financial years and that drives our budget and our workflows and our effort. So it was considered appropriate that notwithstanding what the CEO's anniversary date, it would be advantageous to um, transition to aligning that with the financial year reporting cycle. And I guess just relating to the other item but on this topic, so the um, annual review is through till end of July next year and then the idea would be the following year would be till June and we'd be all lined up then. Yeah. Um, I think it says, um, based on discussion with the CEO, whether he's happy to lose a month from his um, KPI review period, um, there definitely would be need to be some notice and some alignment of the KPIs to reduce framework, um, time frame. Rather. Council members? Okay. Um, the final item on the open agenda this evening is 9.3, Information Bulletin. Any questions in relation to the Info Bulletin? Councillor Loden. Um, we got the Development Services Report through um, a little bit late on this one, but it shows a downward trend. Is that something we can expect to continue to see going forward from here? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. As I said out in the email earlier today, um, the team is um, now full. We have a new uh, rejuvenated planning team. We're going through the process of uh, addressing the backlog, which 
as I mentioned in, um, in the email as well. That's something that's been um, building up over a number of years. Um, so the team has been successful in whittling that down um, so far. It's, um, it's working quite well. We're also going through the process of um, reviewing uh, our approach to customer service, our processes, um, to ensure that we're um, determining applications and assessing applications within the time frame, the statutory time frames we have, and within the time frames expected by the community, as well as maintaining quality. So all of that work um, is happening at the moment, and it's been happening for the last six weeks or so since we we finally got a coordinator on board and a few extra planners. So we now have full team for for a month and a bit, um, and the, it's it's nice to see that the the statistics demonstrate that's already um, been successful to a degree um, and I'm sure that that will continue and you'll see the time frames come down over the next few months um, to a number that we're, we're much more comfortable with and that aligns with our community's expectations. Councillor Lowden. Just on the register of reports, we previously had an item in there around writing to the Water Corporation about a potential grey water um, recycling project and I just wondered how so I, my understanding is that probably got closed out once we wrote the letter and they responded. Do we, and that, that letter spoke to um, a further conversation with the Water Corp, so I'm wondering where that goes in terms of follow-up or tracking or anything like that. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll need to take that on notice. Um, I did have a discussion um, with the staff before I went on leave, but um, unfortunately I can't recall. We, we, we certainly were having a meeting with the Water Corporation, um, but I'm not sure whether that's happened already. Um, given I was away for a month, I, I'll have to take that on notice and follow up. And does that just then sit within the broader responsibility of admi administration that's tracked internally? Um, and how does it get reported back to Council? Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll provide you um, with some information in the briefing notes around that as well. Last one is... Um, in the register of notes and motions, there's one around the single-use plastic bags, and I guess with the recent state government announcement, what happens with that? Does that stay on foot until um, legislation is introduced, or how do we how do we deal with that one? Is there something further we need to do? Uh, through the chair, Ike, that's a good question. <laughs> I thought it basically been uh, superseded or made redundant by the state government's announcement. But I shall take it on notice and um, I can, answer. I can tell you the answer that I told to the Guardian Express, which was that given that the um, statewide ban has been announced and it is relatively imminent, 1st of July 2018, that um, in order to move that forward, we would be reliant upon getting that through the um, Delegated Legislation Committee, um, which is would then have to go to the Legislative Council and I can't say that the State Government or the Parliament would put any resourcing towards that given that the statewide ban is, um, has been promised. So my view would be that it's been made redundant by the announcement of a statewide ban and that we don't need to take any further action. Council Councillor Hallett. Uh, just to clarify also, I guess in terms of the register of notices of motion and those that are in process of being actioned, um, I noticed that the gender equity reporting one is no longer there because we have written to um, State um, Minister and, and Wauga, um, but one of them was also the reporting by the City in the annual report, so wondering if that, given that's still being actioned, whether it should still be there. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I can confirm that um, information regarding that issue is definitely being included in our annual report, um, the draft of which is being presented to the December Council meeting. So. Any further questions on the information bulletin? Okay, that um, will now be moving behind closed doors for two confidential items this evening. So for those who've joined us on the live stream, we say thank you and good night.